and what happens to those who don't. There's just no market for these dogs. Let's not forget that these dogs are the waste product of the greyhound industry. And it all relies on the widespread killing of dogs, which the industry tried to keep secret. It is our problem. We've created it. In the greyhound world, it's all about speed. On a lap of the track, just three seconds divides the dogs that are worth tens of thousands of euro from those that are considered worthless. Typically, a dog's racing career lasts just seven months, but success can see stud dogs valued at more than one million euro. In Ireland, the racing and breeding of greyhounds is legally defined as an industry, managed and policed by two separate organisations. Taxpayers fund the Irish Greyhound Board, or IGB, to look after track racing, gambling and welfare. The Irish Coursing Club, the ICC, raises money from registration fees. It's the controlling authority on breeding, coursing events and the stud book. But the track is struggling. In fact, Ireland is one of only eight countries where you still find greyhound racing. The IGB's five-year strategy cautions that key indicators show a concerning trend. An earlier draft of the same document was more blunt. The number of active owners and gate receipts down 49% and 50%. Advertising has fallen by similar levels. There were serious reputational issues and sustained welfare concerns. In its own words, a perfect storm. If you have realised that attendance is in decline, and it has been in decline for quite some time, um, you then realise that, well, you can no longer rely on this as a, a steady source of income. There are 16 surviving racetracks, but on average, just 329 people go to each meeting. While the crowds are a far cry from before, many still have a soft spot for the sport. It's more than a hobby. It links into the community, and it's far more affordable than horse racing. Race cars like Longford are still full of passionate owner trainers who rear and race their own dogs. Regardless of the occasion, the prospects are the meagre financial reward. But its followers are an ageing generation. In very recent times, this is something that they are working on. They're trying to get a younger demographic of people involved. They're trying to target at uh, people aged between 20, 25, 25 to 30 to try and reinvigorate the people that go uh, greyhound racing. And, and again, that's not something that's unique to this sport. When it comes to funding, greyhound racing is in a privileged position. Most sports here compete for state funding from Sport Ireland. However, funding for horse and greyhound racing is ring-fenced and comes from the Department of Agriculture. It's a big pot. Sport Ireland gets about 60 million euros and that covers about 60 sports. Um, greyhound racing gets um, 16 million euros. So government funding is uh, critical to the existence of the industry as we know it. So if the government funding were, were removed, um, it's likely that many of the tracks would have to close. This year, the IGB received an increased 16.8 million euro from that pot. In total, it has received almost a quarter of a billion euro since the Horse and Greyhound Fund was introduced in 2001. It would be hard to distinguish between a greyhound pup and these newborn lurchers. But under Irish law, the greyhound breed is not a dog. It is a farm animal, falling under the remit of the Department of Agriculture. In reality, their worth is decided by how fast they can run. Animal welfare groups have persistently raised concerns about the number of greyhounds bred for racing. Campaigners estimate that it could be as high as 16,000 per year, but the IGB has not confirmed breeding numbers. Is it the correct figure? Over 16,000 greyhound pups bred in Ireland every year. Um, I think that there's a, a dispute in relation to, I suppose, the figure in relation to unaccounted for dogs. Um, the Irish Greyhound Board becomes aware of a dog when it enters into the racing system. 
I think until such time. So you don't know how many dogs are bred for, for yeah. racing. The I ones think that don't make the grade, you, you wouldn't know about exactly. them. Exactly. But there should be no mystery about it. The stud book is the industry's bible, with an entry made every time a litter of greyhound pups is born. And each greyhound is marked with a unique ear tattoo. The stud book, kept by the ICC, registers every stage of a greyhound's life. The Irish Coursing Club is responsible for maintaining the stud book and for registered greyhounds. And the integrity and value of the industry is very much dependent on a robust stud book. We copied the stud book database and went through it line by line. We calculated how many pups were born and then tracked them through the various stages of their lives. What we found was that thousands of young greyhounds were disappearing every year. But it didn't tell us what happened to the missing dogs. It turns out this answer, and more, had been sitting in the offices of the Irish Greyhound Board. It's all in a confidential report carried out for the IGB in 2017. The report was withheld from us under the Freedom of Information Act. It was even kept from the doll on the grounds it was commercially sensitive. And then, surprisingly, the IGB released much of it online this week, but only after finding out we had got a copy. It is stark reading, and it reveals an ugly truth. This report was carried out by Preferred Results Limited at a cost of €115,000. It described the size of the greyhound pool as out of control, concluding that large numbers of dogs are culled based on their performance. Leaving aside emotions with respect to the culling of dogs, it is simply very wasteful to invest in so many pups and to get so little out of them in return. It warns the issue could threaten the very existence of the industry. Its conclusion? Greyhounds are being bred to be killed. I, th I think there's a general unawareness on the part of the general public of this. Um, but yeah, absolutely, it is a shameful um, part of this industry. One of the main problems with the greyhound industry is the overproduction of dogs. And, and, and we're opposed to any activity that uses animals that breeds large numbers uh, specifically to select either the fastest, the best looking or the strongest animal, uh, whether that's for racing or showing or whatever. Uh, because the, the welfare concerns come from what happens to those animals that don't make the grade. Crunching the numbers on the so-called waste, the consultants revealed staggering statistics. It found about 16,000 greyhounds are born each year. But the report stated that 5,987 are culled because they are too slow or for an unacceptable decline in performance. In other words, 5,987 greyhounds are killed every year simply because they aren't fast enough. These findings were presented to IGB boss Mr Dollard. Eleven days later, he appeared on national television and was asked what happened to the lower grade dogs. But you do accept, I would imagine, that animal activists are very concerned about the dogs that don't make the grade and about the dogs who have ended their racing career and what happens to those dogs. Yeah, I, I accept there's an issue in relation to unaccounted for dogs, but I think the, the figures which are being thrown out are probably well in excess of what the actual figure is because of the number of exports to the UK and elsewhere. In a statement to RTE Investigates, Mr Dollard said he and the board received a PowerPoint presentation on the study before his television appearance but did not have the final report and its findings were disputed. The preferred results report said the situation was pretty bleak but proposed comprehensive reforms. Board minutes recorded the IGB describing these as thought-provoking but impractical. The Department of Agriculture recently got a copy but last week its Secretary General Brendan Gleeson resisted requests by the Public Accounts Committee to make it public. There are issues of significant concern in this report okay. about, and, and there are issues around the entire business model for the sector okay. and the organisation. Yes. He was also asked why the department was not told about it sooner. And would it be the case that the board didn't like the look of this here? Listen, this makes us look bad. Bury that. Well, they didn't agree with the recommendations in the report, as I understand it. But nevertheless, there are matters of significant concern 
in the report, and they may have concluded that there are other ways to deal with this. But on Monday, the IGB released parts of the report, saying it was because of our investigation. The IGB stated it gave a copy to the department when requested and has taken proactive measures to address areas of concern. There's also uh, concerns over the number of litters being produced uh, and the number of animals that are subsequently registered. And we believe there's a, a, a large gap uh, in which thousands of puppies that are born that are never registered simply disappear. We spent months investigating the large-scale culling of dogs. The picture was not pretty, and we'll return to it later. We also found other significant problems in the industry. Anybody involved in, in the industry knows that there is a drugs problem in the industry. We see the long-term negative effect of a lot of these drugs on these dogs. I mean, we see dogs who come in uh, and they've had so much EPO pumped into them that their blood is like treacle. All of that I won without the use of drugs. Never had a drug positive in either England and Ireland. And yet I could win. Many years in the game, Tony Walsh chairs the Greyhound Owners and Breeders Federation. But doping has left him disillusioned. Then they came to the stage where I saw I couldn't win. Uh, and and uh, I just gradually phased out of it. I'd say at the peak I had 50 or 60, at least that many. Maybe he could have even gone to 70 at one stage until uh, this is the first year that it happened a greyhound in the kennel. Mr Walsh's outlook is reinforced by cases appearing in district courts around the country. Clonic Hilty on April 1st, local man Tom Tanner, who was a trainer, pleaded guilty to three charges of possession of illegal animal remedies and one charge of obstructing an officer. He was fined €4,000 and he said he has appealed the severity of the fine. RTE Investigates is aware of two other cases involving prominent trainers that are currently before the courts on similar charges, but they cannot be named until their cases are resolved. There's no improvements. There is absolutely no improvement. And, and, and until that is reversed, then it's, it's only going one way. It's, it's, it's going downhill. Uh, the only um, uh, substances that should be given to greyhounds should be on prescription from a veterinary surgeon. So we would be concerned about doping as an animal welfare issue. The IGB is well aware of the problem. Four years ago, it asked UK professor Tim Morris to examine doping in the sport. He reported back on long-standing and significant deficiencies in policies, processes and their implementation. In a statement to RTE Investigates, the IGB said it has invested in laboratory equipment, worked to educate trainers and assist the department as part of an overall concentrated effort to address any doping and misuse of medication in greyhound racing. The Irish Greyhound Board position is very clear. There is no place in the industry for those who engage in doping practices or misuse of medication. But there has only been a single case where a trainer had his licence revoked by the IGB because of doping issues, and that was in 2015. There have been so few uh, sanctions brought against so few people over the last number of years. It just doesn't add up that that's an industry that is really serious about enforcement of the Drugs and Animal Remedies Acts in this country. The IGB handles doping cases through its independent control committee. Another trainer at the top of his game for 18 years is Owen McKenna. He was fined when a masking agent was found in a dog in his care. Graham Holland has watched dogs he trained win more than 1.8 million euro in prize money at Irish tracks, twice as much as any other trainer. Both lost separate Hype Court challenges to the IGB disciplinary process last year, arising from positive drugs tests. In Mr Holland's case, the challenge arose from a very high profile scandal. It's emerged that Clon Brian Hero, who won the Irish Laurels last July, tested positive for a metabolite of cocaine on three occasions during the competition. Because of the positive test, prize money of €30,000 was withheld. 
But how widespread is the doping problem? To get a sense of scale, we used freedom of information laws to get an inventory of all items seized by the department's Special Investigations Unit over a three-year period. The unit investigates the use of medicines on the black market for horses, farm animals and greyhounds. Then, through court records and industry sources, we were able to establish that 80% of the items came from premises linked to greyhound trainers. It is a veritable drugs cabinet. Uh, I mean, there really is everything there. There are, you know, growth hormones, anabolic steroids, everything to make the dog run faster. There are drugs to control the side effects of other drugs that are being used. It's quite advanced. There's a quite a level of scientific knowledge appears to have gone into some of the doping. Away from the track, the other side of the industry is coursing, where dogs chase live hares in fields. Former Galway hurler and greyhound trainer Jerry Holian has dominated the showpiece national coursing meeting held in Clamel every year, winning three more titles in February to claim prize money worth €24,000. Mr. Holian has trained track dogs, including Jumaraya Lulls, Lulls in control for now by one and a half lengths, which tested positive for pentobarbital during the English Oats in 2017. Jumaraya Lulls beating Ardell Mora and Gilo Sapphire. The trainer blamed the result on contaminated meat that was fed to the dog. Nonetheless, the Greyhound Board of Great Britain, or GBGB, fined him £500. He protested his innocence on the IGB website, saying, I've never had a positive test after running dogs on the track and up the field all my life. However, that was not true. In 2009, a dog he trained tested positive for stanozolol in a heat for the English Derby. Mr. Holian was fined £850. But the story does not end there. RTE Investigates has established that department officials raided Mr. Holian's Athenry kennels on three occasions last year. The results were staggering. More than half of all illegal products seized by the department over a three-year period came from those Athenry raids. Included in the hall were stenozolol, adrenaline, growth hormones and pentobarbital, the same drug he blamed on knackery meat in his last UK positive test. We put all these matters to Mr Holian. He did not respond. Coming up, unlicensed coursing in Cork, and we pick up on the trail of those missing greyhounds. <laughs> Greyhound racing is becoming a little more transparent. In Britain, where most dogs are Irish, newly released figures show that last year a thousand racers were put down for different reasons. In Ireland, official statistics now show 575 deaths at racetracks since 2014. The highest number of fatalities occurred in Mullingar. And one of them's taking a tumble there, the four at the back of the field. Then he's impeded, and the three's taking a heavy tumble. Running slightly wide, but then cuts in. Oh, the four's taking a heavy tumble. Bang there, behind that you've got one, then five. Oh, there was trouble there. I think a nice run up. There's plenty of bumps and barges, and six takes a tumble as two and three badly hampered in the back of the field there. She was bang there on the rails. They round the first quarters, oh, plenty of tumbling on Argy Bargy in behind. Ace up the inside, as is the two, out wide five and six. Oh, the six has been bowled over. The IGB said to address this, it installed a new hair rail and bought a new tractor to maintain the surface. Away from the cameras, other welfare incidents reveal cases of extreme malice. IGB welfare logs describe a number of these as ears tampered with, or to be more specific, cases of ears being scorched, melted with acid, or in these cases, butchered. Why would somebody do this to a young greyhound? As a risen greyhound, he would have had uh, 
tattoo in the ear which would identify him, a birth tattoo, date of birth and his owner. So they cut the ears off so that the owner can't be traced. This is a young greyhound that didn't make it in the racing world. That's basically what it is, he just has been a field racer. Other unsavoury incidents have generated further unwelcome attention. Investigations have been launched here and in France following the discovery of 11 dead greyhounds in a vehicle on board an Irish ferries vessel on Monday afternoon. Behind these padlock gates lay the dumped carcasses of six greyhounds. Um, there was some of different stages of decomposition. Uh, there was two that were shot recently. You could see the pools of blood um, on the floor. There have been numerous other cases, many of which went unreported like dead greyhounds found in the countryside of County Down, Wexford, Cork and in a bog in Offaly. Another found floating down the river Barrow. But one man's cull made the headlines in the UK. This man was today prosecuted for burying dogs he killed behind his house in County Durham. This case came to light when David Smith was secretly photographed taking dogs into a shed on his land in Durham, North East England. When he re-emerged shortly afterwards, both dogs had been shot in the head. The man was estimated to have killed 10,000 greyhounds in this way. Following an expose by the Sunday Times, the dogs in the wheelbarrow were identified as three-year-olds Clash Nitro and Rent-A-Flyer bred and raced in Ireland prior to being sold off. This case had numerous knock-on effects. It was the catalyst for one of the most active anti-greyhound racing movements in the UK, Cage Nationwide. And when I heard that he just got a meagre fine of around £2,000 for wrongful disposal, you know, it, it really touched home with me and made me realise that there was more to the greyhound racing industry and to what these dogs suffer. It also helped change the UK industry's attitude to killing healthy dogs. To see dogs in, in wheelbarrows that have been bolt gunned being put into mass graves is, is, is horrendous. So we had the UK government looked at that, we, they brought in the legislation around the regulations with greyhounds uh, and I, I'm more than confident to say that you know, that would never happen in the UK now. England is the main market for Irish breeders. About 7,000 greyhounds are exported across the Irish Sea every year, sometimes for big money. But the majority sell for a few thousand euro or less. And for some campaigners, that's at the root of the problem. If it wasn't for the Irish industry providing so many dogs and over overproducing so many dogs, um, the, the situation wouldn't be as diabolical here. Greyhound auctions are a regular feature of the industry. In fact, the racing pool in Ireland is a quarter the size of Britain's, yet we breed 16 times more greyhounds than it does. According to the IGB's preferred results report, the greyhound market is oversupplied by 1,000% and most dogs are sold at a fraction of what it costs to raise them. The report warns the industry needs to act to prevent against the below-cost dumping of dogs in the UK, which is ultimately underpinned by Irish taxpayers' money. The export market is served by long-haul transporters authorised by the Department of Agriculture. Each transporter needs a European authorisation introduced to ensure those who drive animals long distances are fit to do so. One of the country's busiest transporters is Cashel-based Elite Canine Transport run by Ross Miles. He is currently disqualified as a sales agent in Britain because of an unpaid doping fine. GBGB's disciplinary committee described the doping breach as a serious one, especially as Mr Miles had been the subject of three separate inquiries during the last three years concerning positive samples at sales trials. Yet a British disqualification has no impact here. 
His Irish transportation permit allows him to continue working across the Irish Sea and he delivers to England almost every week. We asked Mr Miles to comment but we received no reply. Also on Britain's disqualified list is the Clonakilty based former trainer Tom Tanner. 5-2 and 1 bound on indeed and Tom Tanner was motoring home. In July 2016, as an authorised transporter, Mr Tanner drove 24 dogs 1,000 kilometres to a sale at Kinsley Stadium, Yorkshire. Now, when Mr Tanner turned up and the, both the promoter at that track and the trainers went out to see the dogs, they were in a really poor and shocking state. Dogs were transported over from Ireland, not on sufficient bedding, uh, there was no access to water that could be seen, um, and Effectively, they're just laying in their own urine. A GBGB disciplinary committee found the Greyhounds endured appalling conditions on a miserable and 15 hour plus journey from County Cork to Kinsley Stadium, causing them unnecessary and extreme suffering. It decided Mr. Tanner should be warned off, which is the ultimate sanction the GBGB can impose. Effectively, you can't, you can't have anything to do with the UK sport. So you can't attend venues, you can't practice any sort of form of business within that. Again, this ban was UK specific. Later in 2016, the IGB served him with a welfare notice because of the conditions of his kennels. The IGB said recent welfare inspections have not raised concerns. Mr Tanner is entitled to transport dogs under licence from the Department of Agriculture. In a statement, Mr Tanner said he complied with the GBGB decision other than not yet paying the fine. He said the welfare cases did not preclude me from transporting dogs, but I am no longer involved in greyhounds in any capacity. I no longer transport greyhounds. However, that is not what he told us the previous week. Phoning him as a potential customer, he assured us he could take our dogs. I'm out of action at the moment. My the engine is coming to van. OK. So I'll be out of action for another week, week and a half. Yeah, well, it's normally Fridays I travel for delivery on Saturday, Friday week. So not this Friday come, but maybe Friday week you'll be going. Yeah. When we went back to him about this, Mr Tanner said he knew our inquiry to be a fake call. The department said it would not comment on individual cases, but confirmed authorizations may be withdrawn or fixed penalty notices issued where breaches of the authorization are established. But Britain, the key market for Irish greyhound breeders, is now in decline. For the last. The very last. We're off and are racing and four gets a good start in the middle. Bam Bam's Moochie too, though rushing up the inside. There were once 33 Greyhound tracks in London alone. Now there are none. Back home, the decline in attendances at Greyhound racing has worsened financial troubles. And even the fabled Harold's Cross was shuttered and sold to pay off a multi-million euro debt run up by the IGB. But there are occasions that buck the trend. Coursing is banned in most countries, but events here still generate a buzz. Like the showpiece of the coursing calendar, when every February thousands throng to Clamel for the three-day national meeting. A vibrant mix of passion, punters and protests. Despite a loyal following, coursing has been more controversial because of concerns for the hair. I'm very proud of the times when Ireland is unique, but I'm not proud of the fact that we are unique in this. We're only one of three areas who continue to have live, cor live hair coursing. It's banned everywhere else. Hares are a protected species, and coursing is highly regulated. This House voted overwhelmingly in 2013, with certain restrictions and conditions, to facilitate the legal holding of coursing meetings. It comes with, with, with quite stringent conditions and it, that's right and proper and it's right and proper that they are uh, policed and that breaches of those conditions are punished as provided for in the law. The Irish Coursing Club says all the regulations are being observed and on top of that its members spend their time protecting the hair. 
coursing and conservation are inextricably linked. So, so those who are involved in coursing are actively going out and finding those yes, who are illegally correct. hunting. Coursing takes place. Why, why do you do that? Because we have a care for the hare. A coursing club will run a meeting over two days, but for the 363 days of the year, they're out there uh, protecting okay. the hare. But that's not what we found when we took the ferry to Whitty Island off Bantry in West Cork on a Sunday in February. The ferry was full again the following Sunday. And the Sunday after that. The island is known for a thriving population of wild hares. And hares have been captured here for ICC events on the mainland. Importantly, no events are licensed to take place on the island and unregulated coursing is against the law. Once on the island, the coursing party breaks up into smaller groups. They use terriers and shouts to scatter the hares. Greyhounds spot the run and yank hard, looking to be released. The dogs are slipped and the chase begins. This is coursing. The dogs are muzzled, but this event is not licensed and it's not regulated. It is what the ICC said should not happen. And the National Parks and Wildlife Service told us it did not approve of any activity of the type indicated and confirmed no application for a license in respect of such activity was made to the NPWS. Which makes it all the more surprising to see who attended the event. James Kelleher, successful trainer and secretary of McCroom Coursing Club. Skibbereen's Dennis O'Driscoll, a former winning trainer of the Irish Cup. Barry Lynch, who has achieved a similar feat. Bantry's Martin Spillane, a highly successful coursing trainer. Bantry publican JJ Crowley and Ballyvorney transport operator Christy Lucy are successful businessmen and greyhound owners. And this is retired Detective Sergeant Tom Murphy from Bishopstown, Cork. He was an executive director of the Irish Coursing Club from 2015 to 2018. And here he is, rounding up his dogs at an illegal coursing event on Whiddy Island. Mr Murphy told us he believed he had done nothing wrong. The other individuals identified did not respond. The ICC told us it was unaware of unauthorised coursing meetings as we described but that its members in West Cork are one of the few cohorts that actually report and prevent the illegal hunting of the Irish hare. In part three, we find answers to what happens to some of our missing greyhounds. spends just over €100,000 from the €16.8 million Euro it gets from the state on its Irish Retired Greyhound Trust. Each year this helps find homes for about 500 retired greyhounds directly and supports the same again indirectly. But the bulk of the work falls to private rescues. Many dogs arrive in good condition, clearly well cared for. They're just no longer of use. Volume is the biggest problem. Here in South Tipperary, where two shelters sit just three miles apart, both are straining. Last week I had 29 here. I've got another 10 or 15 are waiting to come in. I've been phoned by Kerry Pound asking me can I take in some from them. I've been phoned by owners and breeders. No doubt I'll be getting calls from the vets when they're brought in to be put to sleep as well. 
In response to this programme, the IGB told us it had been working to increase opportunities for slower dogs, with more lower grade races and incentives to have dogs competing for longer. It also pointed to a 12-month trial of morning time meetings to generate content for international gambling platforms, betting on a different event every three minutes. Waterford Track is part of the trial, with races like this, just after 8am, in front of nine people, two of them bookies. Early meetings in Ireland are not designed for the Irish market or the Irish bookmaker market and the internet has allowed that, that you know, these uh, races now are uh, effectively global spectacles um, and it doesn't matter then if you're in Hong Kong or Sydney or Las Vegas, um, this is something that can be marketed to the world. It will certainly not save the industry, it is the reason why the industry has failed in Britain. Over the period of time they were allowed to start betting in betting shops so eventually there was no one going to. And the same will happen here in Ireland. In off-peak racing, each greyhound that turns up gets 20 euro. The IGB told the Minister for Agriculture this would support the grassroots. According to Limerick Animal Welfare, yet another rescue struggling to cope with demand. Morning racing virtually guarantees overbreeding will continue. We asked for better conditions of the track, you know, better care of the dogs. But Limerick kind of a Welfare now no longer thinks it's of any benefit to try and continue with the greyhound industry. It should be stopped. Greyhound racing should stop. Several times a year, Limerick Animal Welfare and Galway SPCA joined forces with an Italian rescue charity, Pet Livieri, to fill up a long haul transporter. I suppose they're very disposable, aren't they? You know, most of them don't often make it to the track, and if they do, they're not good enough to stay on the track. And, they, you know, they're not kept then. They're, they're, we're asked to take them. We get them at young ages. It's a constant supply, um, and they deserve more. They deserve m much more respect, and they deserve to be kept in better condition. They deserve to be looked after. With help from Greyhound Awareness Cork, this van departs for a two-day drive to Milan, saving 20 greyhounds from grim prospects here. There to meet them in Italy would be Stefania Traini, who knows more than most about the Irish industry. She and her husband have already opened their home to five Irish greyhounds, and together they run the Pet Livieri Adoption Centre. Sono tutti i nostri cani, sono, la maggior parte sono greyhound e la maggior parte vengono dall'Irlanda. Ufficialmente risulta ancora un cane irlandese, risulta ancora di proprietà del, di un uomo irlandese e infatti si è chiesto chiarimento all'IGB in merito e l'IGB ad oggi non ha dato una risposta. In recent times the welfare debate here has been focused on the new Greyhound Racing Act which passed through the Iraq this last month. The debate was dominated by the refusal of the government to ban exports to certain countries. An annual white list of countries to which it would be permitted to export greyhounds. Ms. Traini's campaigning took her to Asia, or more specifically to the infamous Canadrome track in Macau. Il Canidrome era il peggiore cinodromo al mondo, tra l'altro l'unico cinodromo legale in Cina. Aperto nel 1963, si calcola che in 55 anni della sua vita lì sono morti qualcosa come 18.000 greyhounds. All animal exports are supposed to be tracked by the department, but since 2016 it has been told of only nine going to China or Macau. But a May 2016 roadside confrontation in Cheshire between activists from Cage Nationwide and an international transporter exposed that some dogs were being driven from Ireland directly to UK airports for onward flights to Asia. China bound dogs, are we? What? China bound dogs, we know all about it. Yeah, we got the tip off that 24 greyhounds would be travelling um, from Hollyheads to Macau. We challenged them, you know, we, we wanted to know why were they sending the dogs there, they, they knew the conditions. The video went viral and in the publicity that followed, thousands of emails hit the IGB inbox. 
It told the department it suffered huge reputational damage. Further videos came on stream from abroad, which viewers here may find upsetting. We know that some dogs have been exported to the Chinese mainland, for example, to be bred for the racing industry. And we don't know what happens to these dogs after some of the, the, the conditions and, and practices in China would not be acceptable in Ireland, they wouldn't be acceptable in the EU, and we should not allow dogs to be exported to countries uh, that have welfare provisions that aren't acceptable. Under intense international pressure, the Canadrome shut down last year, but the trade route has not stopped. Officially, everything hinges on the word direct. Minister Michael Creed has informed the Dáil there were no direct greyhound exports to China in 2017 or 2018. Yet over the same period, the IGB has itself investigated the sale of 14 greyhounds to China. And in all cases, it found the owners had failed to notify the authorities, which is against the law. <laughs> Kerry Elliman from Birmingham runs a greyhound rescue. Nowadays, she focuses on tracking down and rescuing greyhounds internationally. She has travelled to China a number of times. For Kerry, these are grim and difficult journeys, lightened by brief moments of joy like finally finding this Irish greyhound. How long did you try to get him? We've been trying for three years to get an Irish dog. <laughs> and once in her care, she did not let him go, bringing him back to her home in Birmingham. The Chinese want the, the, the top bred dogs, they want the big racers, they want the dogs that they can make more money out of and to keep the bloodlines going in China. So it's not about having an issue with Chinese people having dogs. It's an, it, my issue is where they're going and what industry they're going into when there's no protection for them. This month, she returned from China, having bought another Irish dog. But like all the others that have turned up for breeding in China, they are all still registered to a well-known kennel in Ireland. This is despite their ICC paperwork being in the hands of the Chinese breeders who use it to prove the Irish brand and entice local breeders to pay up to 600 euro a turn to mate with an Irish stud dog. And all this for a trade that officially is not happening. The people in China have got the stud books, they've got the paperwork, they're still microchipped to Ireland and to the IGB and to the GBGB. So, you know, what more proof do you, do you need, really? Hello. Hello, then. The concern of welfare groups is that overbreeding in Ireland is now leading to excessive breeding in China. This year, six Irish greyhounds were added to a Chinese breeding database. The most prolific breeder on it is a County Kerry greyhound, last seen at home five years ago, trying to earn a place in the Irish Derby. The surplus from these breeding regimes end up in some of the worst places imaginable for dogs. The meat market, the first that hits you is the sand um, because they're castrating piglets um, with no anaesthetic. The, with the dogs, they keep them in big trucks and cages. And when I was there, it was a constant flow of greyhounds coming in. And how they bring the dogs into the market as well, they're, they're tied to motorbikes or to trucks, so the greyhounds are having to run along these vehicles as well, and then they sell them, and then they get put in the meat truck. In practices that appear needlessly cruel, even barbaric, greyhounds and other dogs used for cooking are sometimes boiled alive. It's wrong to think, well, it's not our problem because it's in another country, nothing to do with us. But when we're supplying that market and Ireland and the UK are supplying the racing industry in China with the dogs, then it is our problem. We've created it. In the lead-up to the recently passed Greyhound Racing Act, campaigners questioned the fate of Irish dogs going to the UK for sale further afield. 
All we would do is add bureaucracy on responsible greyhound exporters and owners. But we would fail to stop an, an unscrupulous exporter who had exported to a country with a pro problematic welfare record. The animal welfare lobby looked explicitly to ban sales to countries like China and an increasingly popular destination, Pakistan. In recent years, grave concerns have been raised about the export of Irish greyhounds to race in countries where the welfare standards are poor or non-existent. There's no animal welfare laws whatsoever in Pakistan. We are being told by Pakistan trainers themselves that after one season that these dogs are often sold onto pig hunters and they are used for um, hunting wild boar where their um, limbs, they will be dismembered, their limbs broken um, and they'll die horrific deaths. Footage like this is published by some of the same Facebook groups involved in the racing industry and it is gruesome. Again, this is a trade that, on paper, is not happening. The department has no records of dogs getting clearance to go there. We examined 47,000 ownership transfers in the ICC stud book since 2011 and found just one recorded sale to Pakistan. Yet our investigations suggest it is a thriving, celebrated and open trade. Within IGB records, we found evidence of sales going back 60 years. Almost every week, kennels in Pakistan announce a new arrival from Ireland, often posting photos on Facebook for their Irish friends. 70% of advertised stud dogs there are Irish bred. And many prominent people, especially in the world of Irish coursing, are still the registered owners of greyhounds who are currently competing and breeding in Pakistan. In a statement, the ICC said, if the buyer lives outside the country and fails to comply with the law and lodge the appropriate paperwork, it is not possible to effect the necessary changes to the register. In what seems a world away, families gather in Milan, waiting for rescued Irish greyhounds they are about to foster. We can't keep going around and relying on other countries to make sure that they can adopt Irish dogs. I know that she's been really lucky and some of her friends aren't so lucky. They're, they're just treated so, so harshly at home. You know, it's just, it's, it's, uh, they make you very proud and very ashamed at the same time. There are going to be an awful lot of dogs that are not going to be wanted. We need to make it easy to get them out of that industry rather than have them get a bullet in the head. If the dogs that get to Italy are the lucky ones, what of those left behind? And what happens to the thousands of greyhounds that go missing every year? Euthanasia is an option for the unwanted. The IGB says going to the vet is the most appropriate and socially acceptable method, and this was a key recommendation in its code of practice. But this costs the owner about 80 euro. In the past, a cheap alternative was the local dog pound. Between 2010 and 2014, uh, over 3,400 greyhounds were surrendered to dog pounds in Ireland. 87% of those were uh, euthanised. That's almost 3,000 greyhounds euthanised in that five-year period. Uh, when I joined the ISPCA, we put a stop to that. But there was evidence that some owners were taking a cheaper option. Ten years ago, an article in the Irish Sun caused outrage when it reported that this knackery in Camolan, County Wexford, charged ten euro to destroy greyhounds with a bolt gun. Hello, Ireland. A decade on, we rang the same knackery, asking could we get rid of a greyhound after a sale fell through. Oh, yeah, that should be all right there, yeah, yeah. The only concern was the expected arrival of a Department of Agriculture inspector. No, 
It's around 20 euro. We were asked for 20 euro to have the dog put down. I'll go here and over just help me. I want to have no space in it for the top of the amount of the big layer, so. Moments later, the department inspector arrived. Thanks for the bother. I don't know for a minute. They're coming here now. They're coming back in about seven minutes. The knackery staff weren't phased by the officials' arrival, but they advised us to put the dog out of view. We made our excuses as planned, took the healthy dog with us, and left. The Department of Agriculture licenses and polices knackeries, known officially as Category 2 Intermediate Plants. So we asked it, was it okay to have a greyhound killed in this way? The department said no, because food safety laws demand that these animals are kept away from these plants. Dogs, including greyhounds, are classified as a Category 1 animal and cannot enter a Category 2 plant, dead or alive. Euthanasia of greyhounds or other animals is not approved. In a statement, Larry Earl Limited said the only meat processed is bovine animals and that the department has full access at all times to the company's records. But the Kamola knackery was not an isolated case. Oh, we put them down here and we dispose of them. Yeah, there's no problem, like, yeah, if you want to do that, we'll do that, you know. All right, well, we need to bring them over there, we'll have them for you. We'll put them down and take them from you and I'll give you a receipt for them. We contacted 30 licensed knackeries and made the same request. Half of them refused, either referring us to a vet or saying they were no longer allowed to put down dogs. The other 15 said they would kill a greyhound for prices ranging from 10 euro to 35 euro each. No, if it's in a community of one dog, it's 20 euro. Like, what have you treated? A ten euro each, yeah, ten week. It's 20 euro each. Make sure that the ash the ash you must well know when they come to us. Twenty ahead. We're, we're getting twenty, thirty euros there to take in dogs, all animals, all that sort of shit like you know. Yeah, with a hundred euros for the three mail rifle. It's they're ten euro each per town. It's a two two rifle, that's what I use. John Styles and Sons Limited outside Port Leash stood out because it told us it shot dogs in bulk. It's 20 euro apiece. There's not bringing in dogs in tens. How much is that? 20 euro. 20 euro. Yeah. Okay. And then? So pay like. Oh, yeah. Oh, over there, there's a pin, there's a pin there beside the, beside the wall, put them into it. Where do you go? Bring, bring the treated back then, and hold that then, we'll do the treated, all right? Put the treated, yeah. yeah. All okay. right, now we're halfway. We took our dog and left. In a statement, the company said it has operated its business within the permits held and rules and regulations as advised to them by the Department of Agriculture. The department told us it will review the situation with regard to the activities of Category 2 plants when it sees the evidence and footage detailed in this programme. But we carried out undercover surveillance to get a sense of what happened when the owners left their dogs behind. Over the course of just one week, we witnessed the end of four greyhounds. On Monday, the first two were dropped off and brought inside. One minute later, the animals lay dead on the floor. They were collected by a teleporter and dumped in the skip outside. Another day, another dog. Dumped in a skip. On Wednesday, another dog, the same fate, delivered, destroyed, and dumped. This dog was not even fortunate enough to avoid suffering. Uneasy on arrival at the knackery, the dog pulled nervously. The man who brought the dog sat in his car while the animal was taken away. A single shot to the back of the head 
The man in the car waited for the return of the caller. And then driving off, leaving the dog writhing on the floor for the last minutes of its life. Before it was dumped, like so many of our greyhounds, into a skip for collection and disposal.